What's up, Roots listeners? Matt here with my amazing co-host, Ryan and Erica, and we have an awesome episode for you this week. We are on to almost 200 episodes at this point when this episode gets released. Yeah, we got to be closing in. We are, um, and we have a lot of episodes in store for you this year. So if you are just tuning in for the first time, welcome. You're listening to the best beer podcast, in my opinion. Ever. Well, this is my opinion, right? I mean, but... um, you know, we're happy to uh, get guests from all across the country. And this one we got through TikTok of yeah. all friggin' places. The first time I got one through TikTok. Um, was and exciting. it was just because I happened to like send a DM and I was like, hey, you guys only have 13 followers on TikTok. We only have 13 followers on TikTok. Now, if we mention who this brewery is, you definitely know who they are. And the only reason <laughs> they had 13 followers on TikTok is because I think they just made the account and yes. I happened to see it. Yeah. But uh, Erica, who do we have on today? We have Rogue. That's right. Where is Rogue out of, Erica? (sighs) This is a... I think it's an Oregon. It is an Oregon. Specifically, Newport, Oregon. Okay, Newport. I was going to say Portland because everything's from Portland, but it's not from Portland. (laughs) Um, And we are joined here with Danny, Danny Connors. That's how you pronounce your last name, right? I have to make sure. (laughs) Yeah, it's not it's not like French or anything. All right, cool. I just want to make sure, you know. Um, and you have a pretty interesting title at Rogue. Uh, Erica, what is his title? Do you remember? Oh, it was like a mad scientist, uh, badass MC, I think was part of it. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. My my business cards say math enthusiast slash badass MC. Enthusiast. That's what it was. Not scientist, not mad scientist. So math enthusiast. We're going to get into that into the episode, but... If I was to count how many beers I had this week, it would only be two. Good for you. Yeah. We are training. We, as in We, as in you, you, yourself, and I. uh, (laughs) Training for a 10K, which I might have told people I'm training for a half marathon, so they think I'm cooler, but yeah, 10K. (laughs) Uh, And the beers I had, like, I I, I am sorry, Groots listeners, were Miller High Life. (laughs) All right. That's all right. uh, Have you had any of the uh, non alcoholic beers? There's been a lot of up around here. So I'm. No, I that's haven't. fine. That's I, I, fine. I, 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 I know it's dry January and not got non alcoholic no, beers no. are cool. Uh, Ryan, have you gotten a chance to have any NA beers? Negative Ghost Rider. Uh, yeah, go. no, neither have I. I've been meaning to stop at Notch and try theirs. Um, just I think it's so cool that some like local places are doing that now. Yeah. So has the uh, NA craze? Oh, that's kind of cool. We we coined just that segue now. Right hit, in uh, Newport, Oregon. It has not hit Newport, Oregon. No. no. Um, we keep tab we keep tabs on that stuff. Um, you know, we we drink other people's things when they come out, but we uh, we have not chosen to pull the trigger on the NA train. Well, we have our not on the beers anyway. We have our CBD seltzers, mm. um, but uh, we do make sodas. But yeah, we have, we haven't done the non alcoholic beer thing. Yeah, it's it's becoming more and more popular. It's a thing out here area. for sure. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely down yeah. to try them. Uh, I thought it was interesting that Notch did a New England style IPA. <laughs> and you know, yeah. I was like, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, most people seem to do the the hazy IPA thing when they do it, which is really weird to me. Yeah, you think it would just try to make like a? I guess it's hard. To ale, an ale. Yeah. Ale. I don't know. Whatever. Yeah. Uh, Erica Ryan, have you drank anything cool this week? I had some really cool stuff from Leatherman's. Ooh, yeah. did you? Yeah, I, I like Leatherman's. I like the sour that we got from them. Mm, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, actually, I'm sorry not to interrupt, Erica. I did drink actually my last beer from our friends Tilton Brothers, oh. who unfortunately had to close their doors. Yes, yes. Um, in New Hampshire, and uh, really, really sad that they had to close their door. Um, I R. loved I. what they were doing with their beer and especially their food. Um, you know, it's important when these things happen. You know, your your favorite brewery. Um, don't have those coulda, woulda, shoulda moments where you're like, oh man, if I wish I went to that brewery. Like, if you have that feeling to go to that brewery, go to that brewery because you don't know like how long they're going to be right. around, right? And uh, yeah, we just interviewed them recently, and we had no, no idea. Indication. I don't know if they knew, and just, but uh, we certainly had no indication. Yeah. So. so I guess my public service announcement to our listeners is: go to your brewery that you love and uh, give them some love. Support your local brewery. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Erica, what did you drink? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> we drink a lot. But uh, yeah, if you want uh, to support the podcast, follow us on all our social medias. Um, it, it's, it's, go to our Instagram. Our link tree is there. It has our Patreon. It has our TikTok. We are Twitch streaming now, which I might do tonight if I'm bored, but we'll, we'll find out. Why not? Yeah. But now, on to the episode. 
So, Danny, we start all of our episodes by asking our guests your first memory of beer and your role at the brewery. We kind of teased the role in the intro, but why don't you expand on, expand that. on that? Yeah. Um, my first memory of beer would be, <clears throat> I think, when I was like a little kid, you know, probably like five or six and being like, Daddy, what's that? And he said, oh, it's beer. And I said, oh, can I try it? And I think he probably thought about it for a second and was like, yeah, sure. And then let me have a drink of it, whatever it was, a Budweiser. And then like all little kids, you go, oh, that's disgusting. And then it's kind of a parent's way of trying to teach little kids like, yeah. Avoid <laughs> alcohol Don't drink it. <laughs> um, that was probably my earliest. Um, and then when I, uh, one other thing when I got older, um, Rogue has something we do called garage sales. And we'll have at our pubs when we have um, leftover cases of beer that are close to, you know, being out of code, you know, getting a little old, we just kind of do fire sales and just start selling them for really cheap out of the pubs. And well before I was, I had anything to do with Rogue and I was in college and I went to dinner with my family at a Rogue pub and I bought a bunch of dead guy um, when I didn't know anything about beer or bother to like look at ABVs <laughs> or anything. And then I think we were, ended up trying to play beer pong with dead guy. Oh God. Like, <laughs> and it was rough. <laughs> dead guy is, you know, it's like one, it's, you know, it's got a good malt kick to it, a good hoppy bitterness to it. And it's like 6.8%. So it was yeah. not, uh, not a good idea. <laughs> well, you survived um, that night and yeah. uh, here yeah. we are. <laughs> Have you played beer pong with, with uh, dead man since? No, um, we used to make, we used to make an Irish lager. That was a good light Ooh. beer. I think one time I did that with buddies, but yeah, I don't the, I mean, the, the most important thing is that I haven't really played much beer pong <laughs> at all in a long time, which I'm proud of. Yeah. You, good for you. you grew up. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so proud. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so your title's not head beer pong, bro. It's what? Yeah. My, my title is a uh, senior innovation manager. Yeah. I think. Yeah, that's my Maybe. title. Cool. Uh, it, it seems to change day to day. Um, we've never been big on titles here. But um, yeah, I, I was, I think when we scheduled this, my title was still Innovation Brewer. Okay. Um, and since then, I have taken on a role that um, um, kind of managing all the projects for new liquids. So whether that's beer, whether that's um, whiskeys, whether that's our canned cocktails or our CBD stuff. Um, yeah, just kind of overseeing every project. Awesome. Uh, you know, however old you were when you first had that first taste of beer, like what was the original plan for you? Like, what did you want to be in and how did you disappoint your parents going into beer? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I originally was, when I was going into college, I was interested in like zoology. Okay. Um, and so I luckily got a biology degree, um, <laughs> And then um, it turns out zoos are horrible, horrible places. Um, didn't want to be around zoos. Didn't want to, I mean, it probably would have been cool, but I didn't really like want to like move to Africa and, um, you know, research lions as much as cool as that would have been. And I just don't think I really had it in me. And then um, about halfway through getting a biology degree, I realized like, oh, I like beer and I could totally get, do beer stuff with this biology degree. So just kind of kept on going down that path. And then right out of school, um, just, you know, because I'm from the Portland area originally, I just started sending resumes to every single brewery in Oregon. Luckily there's a ton of them and Rogue was the first one to hit me up and offer me a job. So, and then I haven't made any changes for 11 years now. Awesome. So now were you ever a home brewer or did you just, um, just start getting into it just from cellaring on. I was doing a little bit of home brewing, but I, uh, I don't think I ever made one like passable beer <laughs> before, <laughs> before yeah. I was brewing professionally. Yeah. 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 It's okay. I, I mean, there's a lot of home brewers who I don't think have made passable beers <laughs> either. So <laughs> it's all right. Myself included. Yeah. <laughs> um, was it just a passion of like, Hey, I like beer or was it like, you I like the industry. I like the industry. Yeah. I like what it's about. Yeah. It was a combination. Um, it was, I like beer. I like all the aspects of 
fermentation and the DIY and um, the, like the industry liked culture of Oregon. Um, you know, and the idea of being able to hang out in the Portland area was very interesting. Um, and uh, also just making something that is consumable is really appealing. I've, uh, I used to have a, a crappy summer job where I would set up tents for an event company and you'd go and you'd bust your ass to set up these big tents. Usually in the summertime, we'd set up a bunch for like fireworks around 4th of July and you'd work in the heat and you'd work super hard to set up this tent knowing in the back of your head, like I have to come back here next week <laughs> and take down this damn tent <laughs> yeah. and like creating something that is um, experienced and consumed in a different way. And I, I think like at the time, maybe I was, I was not aware of this, but like alcohol is this like very almost like sacred place in humans lives of like how we consume it and their social connections and stuff like that. And so being able to like make a beer and have a friend consume it and be able to say like, I made that is very, uh, very appealing. And probably one of the coolest parts about being a brewer. When you, 11 years ago, when you told people I'm going to work at a brewery and, you know, from that job of putting up tents, I mean, being a cellarman is not a luxurious job either, right? Like you are, you're busy. You're doing a lot of work. You're learning a lot on the fly. Um, what did people say 11 years ago to you? Um, I don't think anyone was like discouraging or people probably got a chuckle out of it, but <laughs> I don't think, I don't think I necessarily surprised anyone. Um, I think I, and plus I had been telling people like, this is, I'm interested in this. This is what I think I want to get into for probably about two years prior to that. Um, I think everyone was, my parents included were very, um, encouraging partially because the economy was absolute garbage at the time. And they were just happy that their recently graduated college student was getting a job and getting yeah. the hell out of their house. <laughs> so that was, they were like, great, whatever, man, you got a job. Leave run with it, run with it. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Uh, so how did you stick with it to where you are today? I mean, being a solar man is such a, like Matt was saying, such a difficult job, such a hard job. Um, yeah. Why stay with it? Um, you know, I was pretty lucky that I uh, got moved out of cellaring pretty early on. Nice. <laughs> um, I only had to do it really for a few months. We, oh, were, good. we were hurting for brewers um, and kind of going through like a weird transition phase with personnel. So very quickly it was like, uh, we needed another brewer and I was, and then I was just standing there and they're like, okay, Danny, you're, you're going to go start training tomorrow to brew. And I said, okay, cool. Um, so yeah, just the right place at the right time. Um, but yeah, it's not, fun and it's um <laughs> and craft beer you know people are like so you know obviously the boom and what it is and however thousands and thousands of breweries there are now across north america and uh I, people are always like oh that's so cool it's like yeah it's it's just a minimum wage job in a warehouse like yeah. it's <laughs> it's it's you know people think it's sexier but you're just working in a warehouse doing manual labor um and you know it's a factory it just so happens that you make beer instead of like cardboard boxes and people think that's cool, but it's not like <laughs> the day to day is not quite that. No. So to this day, do you still brew a lot of dead guy or have I, you, when's the last time I you brewed it? I haven't brewed dead guy probably in over nine years. Nice. Um, Could you brew it though in your sleep? I could. Yes. <laughs> partially, partially because the, um, the brew house we have down there, it's a hundred barrel brew house and it's, I mean, it's basically built to brew dead guy. It was, you know, um, and it, yeah, you, there, there are programs that give you timing and say, here's how much malt you need. Here's when you should stop the boil and add these many hops and things like that. Uh, so I could probably go down there and not screw it up too bad. Um, nice. but yes, I have brewed, um, a lot of dead guy in my day. And the, I basically was a, I basically was a production brewer there for a year. And, uh, yeah, so I brewed thousands and thousands of barrels of dead guy. So a lot of times people don't know the face behind the beer that they're drinking. Your the beer that you brewed has been consumed by a lot of people. Probably us. Probably, <laughs> probably myself. Um, is that a weird thing? Like, it's, you're like a musician almost, right? Like, a musician doesn't have any idea of how many times, like, someone's heard their song. Yeah. 
No, it is very cool. And it's one of the um, cool parts about working for a brewery of our size. Um, you know, I think a lot of people probably there's, there's, there's positive and negatives. A lot of people, uh, you know, real beer nerdy people would prefer being at maybe a smaller brewery. Smaller breweries have more mobility. They can turn around tomorrow and say, let's brew a Maybach, you know, and they can do that. At Rogue, we have to plan things out quite a bit further in advance because we're dealing with all these moving parts of a national distribution, international distribution, blah, blah, blah. Um, but on the, on the flip side, yeah, I brew beer that somebody in Israel is drinking or, you know, someone in anywhere. We, we're huge. We have a, such a far reach um, and people on the East Coast and, um, you know, family I have in Chicago or anywhere I can say, yeah, that IPA you saw in the store, that was my recipe, you know, so that's pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. So before we get into Rogue, because Rogue, when I first found, was always in 22-ounce uh, bombers. Yeah. Um, we have a word from our sponsors. So take it away, Sound Guy Ryan. Did you know that your favorite Massachusetts breweries use hops from a local family-owned hop farm right here in Massachusetts? Our friends over at Four Star Farms are there for you, whether you're a commercial brewery or a small batch home brewer. Make sure to head over to their website today and get your hands on some of the best and freshest hops available locally. Cheers. Cheers. At our local homebrew shop, Beer and Wine Hobby, you can get everything you need to make beer, wine, cider, cheese, and more. Not sure where to start? They have knowledgeable staff there to help. Beer and Wine Hobby is family owned and located in Danvers, Massachusetts. Visit their website, beer-wine.com, and use our promo code BRUTES for 10% off your online order today. Shirts on Tap is the box subscription service for craft beer lovers. Each month, Shirts on Tap partners up with seven different breweries from across the country and collaborates on a sweet custom shirt design. We've been teamed up with Shirts on Tap since the inception of the podcast and are proud to announce a new promo code for all of our listeners. To get your first shirt for $5 off, go to the link in our description below and use the promo code. And remember, drink better beer, wear better shirts. We're back. So my first memory of Rogue is... When the Deadliest Catch came out, you guys Ooh. did a Deadliest Catch beer. Um, and forgive me, I forget what it was, but I was obsessed with that show. Rest in peace, Captain Phil. Like, yeah, I don't know it, was, uh, it was, I think, Sig's Northwest Dale. Okay, yeah. 22-ounce um, bomber. I mean, 11 years ago, that, that, was, that, a was, thing. that was a thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you guys brewing a lot in 22-ounce bombers? I see you all. Ever, ever, I feel like I see bombers, but... Yeah, not much anymore, if at all. Yeah, um, yeah we held, we uh, we really held on to the twenty twos for a long time. I mean, they're such a good. Well, the one reason they do it it was accessibility. Um, there's great margins for breweries that sell in twenty twos. Um, I, as a beer nerd, I always appreciated it because you could show up to the bottle store and just grab like two bottles, and that was you know having those beers for the night or even just one. Um, and then when the, um, mobile canning companies came along or mobile bottling companies came along, everyone, the Maheen was the company, they're out of Washington and they were building these 22 ounce bottling machines and they became very available. So every small brewery, um, in the country all of a sudden had the ability to package and get to market in 22. So they were great, but, uh, yeah, it turns out people want cans a lot more now. <laughs> yeah. And actually, to bounce back a little bit, how long has Rogue been a brewery? Do you know when you guys started? 88. Wow. Uh, founded in 88. Wow. That's crazy. And you've always been in Newport, or have you guys, like... They um, started in a little town in southern Oregon called uh, Ashland. Okay. Um, and that's actually where the... There's, like, a world-famous Shakespeare festival that Ooh. happens there every summer. Um, and so that's where our Shakespeare stout got its name okay. uh, way, way back in the day, but they grew out of that space pretty quickly and, uh, it got, it like flooded really bad oh. one year. Wow. And they basically needed a new space. And the, the legend goes that 
um, Jack Joyce, who was one of the founders, who was kind of the leading man for the first like 20 plus years of the company, or I guess like almost 30, um, he went looking for a new space and was up on the Oregon coast and got snowed in in Newport, which doesn't happen on the Oregon coast. Um, and he was stuck there and he <laughs> ran into a lady by the name of Mo, who offered him a spot uh, in her, she had a building and uh, she had an apartment above it. And he, she rented him the space below uh, as a brew pub. And the, the deal was that uh, he had to put a picture, a naked picture of her in every, in the bar at all times. <laughs> So Wait, is that the, real? That's real. That's, that's real. <laughs> so you can go. I love it. And any rogue, rogue pub, there's it's the same picture. It's it's Mo in the bathtub. Um, she's uh, you know she's covered up uh, in bubbles. by bubbles and water <laughs> and whatnot. Um, but uh, yeah, that's in everyone. And actually, this woman Mo is there's there's a famous restaurant chain on the Oregon West Coast on the west coast of the United States called uh, Mo's Chowder. Um, and so it's kind of this thing that's all in all a lot of oh, larger, right. larger cities along the Oregon coast and up into Washington as well, I think. And is she the that's namesake crazy. of that? Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> Good for her. Good for Mo. I know. She's killing yeah, it. Yeah. She did kill it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I know nothing about Mo's chowder and, uh, I don't have naked pictures of me in my, in a brewery, but <laughs> that's really cool. That's great. That's great. <laughs> that's a first one for us, but, um, there's various rogue locations. How many are there right now? <laughs> Yeah, so right now there is, um, we've actually c closed a few spots over the last couple of years. Um, right now we have one in Astoria, which is out mm -hmm. on the, the coast, the far north coast. Actually, it's like right where Oregon and um, Washington meet in, on the big bay there, uh, the mouth of the Columbia. And then we have two locations in Portland. Uh, the south on um, the southeast location where I used to brew for our pilot stuff, and then we have one on the campus of Portland State University, and then we wow. have three locations in Newport. Um, there's a pub in the brewery in the main production brewery. There's a uh, pub at the old brewery location across the bay, and then we have by our distillery. We have we call it the Sunset Bar, um, and that's like a, a third spot you can go find a beer. Yeah. Um, wow. yeah, we used to have one in Everywhere. Seattle <laughs> that kind of, that went the way of the Buffalo at the beginning of COVID. Mm -hmm. And then we used to have one in San Francisco and that one <laughs> burned down on St. Patrick's day, wow. like six years ago. Or been a crazy Gosh. party. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, when did Rogue start, you know, dabbling in spirits? You know, I know you mentioned CBD. You do uh, sodas, sodas, you do all kinds of stuff. Yeah, the the sodas have been going for a while. We made a we've made a root beer for a really long time. I mm -hmm. couldn't tell you how long, but it's I think it's twenty plus years. Um, and then, oh man, somebody's gonna be pissed at me for the spirit side. We've been doing <laughs> spirits for I think at least fifteen. I think maybe it's like eighteen or something like that. Wow. We've been doing it for a while. Um, and then the the CBD stuff is new. Those have only been around for a year and a half, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe not, not two years. And then same with the canned cocktails. They're very new. They're about the last uh, two years. What, um, made you get into like CBD seltzers? I mean, obviously with different laws across different States, is that only exclusive to your specific state state? How does that work? Yeah. Right now we can only send those to Oregon and Washington. And I think we're sending them to California soon, but yeah, it's, it's tough. You got to go state by state and it's pretty weird. And, um, you know, moving things across state lines can be pretty tricky. Um, cause all of a sudden then you could be like committing a federal offense. <laughs> so all of a sudden you're a felon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and like, Hey man, just drive this truck, uh, up to our pub in Washington. Why don't you drive it? Yeah, right. um, but, um, yeah, that's a little bit tricky and, and liquor is the same too. Um, it can just be, it's, it's just really weird. Cause you have to manage different relationships. Sometimes you're dealing with the state, like in Oregon, it's all state controlled. So you literally like sell your liquor to the state and then they turn around and distribute it through the liquor stores. Um, yeah. or, you know, so maybe you're, maybe you're sending liquor to whatever an individual state or you're sending it to, um, BevMo or whoever in California, it's, it's different everywhere. So luckily I don't have to deal with that. That's what lawyers are for. So now <laughs> what is the draw of the CBD? seltzer like i mean do you actually get any kind of 
high or any kind of relaxation from that? Is it just a cool marketing thing? <laughs> no, I think there is something to it. Um, whether or not that's placebo, you know, who knows? I, I definitely think there is something to it, though, that, you know, you drink one and it, it makes you <laughs> mellow out a little bit. Um, I think I think it was sort of as everyone is turning to NA, I think it's a good um, I think it's probably the best way to get into that realm. Mm -hmm. It still seems like there's value added. People feel like they're getting something out of it. Um, we add other things that are kind of like in that world of like the, the health benefit stuff. We have apple cider vinegar in there. We have L-theanine. Um, so it's, it's kind of supposed to be this feel good beverage. Um, and I, I mean, I can personally say like, it's, nice for an employee here that we produce something that's a non-alcoholic option so like yeah. when i'm sitting in the office and it's like oh man what, what am i going to do you know it's, you can go <laughs> to the fridge and grab one of those and it's it's definitely nice to have that um i have that alternative and they're delicious and it's nice to have that alternative that you feel good about drinking yeah yeah cool uh so as a as a brewer i mean did you have to learn how to distill or do you let that did someone, like, else do did that? someone else do that? <laughs> I learned how to do it. I mean, we have we have proper distillers who know what they're doing. Um, we had a few locations, and I've done I've done almost everything in for Rogue, um, partially because my position was so weird as an innovation brewer. But I touched a lot of things. Like I've <clears throat> I was our I'm our de facto cider expert. You know, I spent like two years on a deep dive learning a lot about cider. I've distilled. I know my way around a still and how it works and I've done it. I'm not, I'm not the, a master distiller by any means, but I could like make moonshine if I needed to in the yeah. world ends, which is pretty useful. Um, <laughs> I, I know about, you know, I know about sodas. I know about all the weird things that go into um, putting non-alcoholic stuff into cans and how you have to make sure cans don't explode and referment. Mm. Um, I know a lot about mead and honey. Um, if you want to go down that really nerdy, uh, rabbit hole, but yeah, I know a lot of random weird little things. Uh, yeah. so the, sh the, the short answer is yes, I did learn how to distill. So someone like yourself, right? What keeps you at rogue and not starting your own brewery? Ooh. Ooh um, part of it is just like, it is not a good idea to open another brewery in Portland, Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> People just keep on doing it. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, well, yeah, part of it's like I said, you know, having that reach, having that, um, having act, like being able to create beer on such a scale. Um, <clears throat> some, there's a lot of parts of being like, we're, I mean, we're not that big, but we're that relative, we're like a middle sized brewery. Um, and there's just things that you have access to that you wouldn't have on a smaller scale, like whether it's getting a certain amount of hops to be able to make like the absolute best IPA you want to make. It's just, I mean, it's harder for a little guy to do yeah. that. Um, uh, you know, do you guys have hop selection? Yeah, we do. Um, it's been pretty wonky these last few yeah. years yep. with, <laughs> with COVID. Um, and then there was, and then the smoky, all the fires last year, like, we, we were literally have been selecting for like smoke taint over the last oh, couple of years. Fun. So you're like, Oh yeah, that's, that's kind of weird. Um, <laughs> but yeah, just being like, and especially my role as innovation brewer, I just spent the company's money on stupid stuff that I wanted to do. I'd they'd be like, here's a new hop variety. I'd be like, cool. Send me two boxes, man. I don't, yeah. I'm gonna, you know, just, I'm going to brew an IPA tomorrow, you know? And like a small brewer who is trying to, uh, you know, stay in the positive for next month. Like he doesn't get to mess around and try out new hop varieties. Like he's busting his butt. Right. 80, 80 hours a week, brewing the beer, filling the kegs, delivering the kegs, and then balancing the books at the end of the night somehow. Like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, doesn't seem very fun. <laughs> um, the other yeah. thing too is I, I have a mortgage and two kids. So, mm. um, things like healthcare and, uh, those are nice. Yeah, it's pretty important, it turns out. <laughs> um, did you see yourself being here 11 years later, though? Yeah, I think so. Um, cool. I mean, I've, I've stuck around this long, so. <laughs> it's another 11. <laughs> yeah, it goes, it goes pretty quick. Right? Yeah. And are you guys still considered, I mean, you must be at this point, you're still considered craft beer. Yeah. You're not surpassing Sam Adams. 
Yeah, no, we're nowhere, we're nowhere near the size of those guys. Uh, Seems like you guys are. I don't know. I feel like I see you guys all over, but that's the thing about Rogue is we have always far exceeded. Um, the model from very early on was spread very far and thin. Our distribution, whereas a lot of a lot of other breweries kind of cover their home ranges um, until they can move out. So, like we're in Oregon, there's brewers like Widmer. Who now is who is now Budweiser, um, or like Deschutes? Um, mm-hmm. Deschutes is way bigger than us, but um, probably a lot more people out east know about Rogue than Deschutes because I don't think Deschutes has you know been distributed further than the Rockies for you know the last thirty years. Yeah, I personally, so, yeah. Never heard of them? Yeah. Do you know? They, yeah, they're huge. Yeah. How has that worked? I feel like, like you said, it's such a scary thing to spread yourself so thin and all over the country. Uh, yeah, how do you make that work? It's a lot of managing relationships with distributors because you have to figure out, you know, and it's just regionally, like this guy covers the tri-state area, this guy covers Southern Mm -hmm. Illinois, this guy covers Central Illinois, this guy covers Northern Illinois, and like um, managing all those relationships with literally hundreds of distributors. Um, And and honestly, I don't, uh, go ahead. No, and somehow standing out as well, right? I mean, you're shipping your beer to places where no one knows or has had heard of you before. Yeah. And and a lot of that is um, because we're as old as we are, Mm -hmm. those relationships started where it was literally like you were just trying to convince the guy like, hey, you should probably pour something beside Budweiser, you know? (laughs) And it was back in the day, it was like us and Sierra Nevada and you know, anchor and, you know, like it used to be, we were, we were competing with 10 other craft breweries. Yeah. Right? Now there's 7,000 other craft breweries in the U S we have to compete with. <laughs> um, but I think those is having those established relationships with people is huge. Well, before we get into more of this, that's right. I think we need a quick break. We do. Ryan, cue up the break machine. Please. Take it away. Are you a solo artist, band, podcaster, or anyone else who needs recording services? Well, we got a place for you where your vision can become a reality. Welcome to Small Pond Studios, built by hand with heart and sweat equity by musicians for musicians. Go to smallpondstudios.io to reach out to get more information. And make sure you let them know that Brute sent you. Hey, Sound Guy Ryan here. Didn't know if you heard, but we're a part of the Hopped Up Network. There you'll find other informative podcasts about beer. So go ahead, follow them on social media, and visit them on their website, hoppedupnetwork.com, to learn more about the people, beer, and breweries from around the country. And until next time, thanks for listening. Cheers. You mentioned before you get to just, you know, kind of spend the company's money and do, whatever you your, want. do your stupid ideas. <laughs> so what's some of the stupid ideas that never see, saw the light of day? Oh, man. No, all my ideas are good ideas. <laughs> it's the ones they tell me to brew. God. Um, so, like, do, uh, do you have like a like a committee that's like we have we have done some market research and we think that. Cold lagers are the thing to brew right now. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're getting to that point where we like maybe look at market data and feel like that. Eh. Also, you just get you just have your finger on the pulse and say like, hey, you know, this hazy IPA thing really seems like it's got legs. <laughs> I think we're going to need to brew one of these. Yeah. Good thing we did too. Um, <laughs> but I would say for the most part, we're just relying on um, people that pay attention and we think have we, you know, we think we're pretty smart. So we, you know, like, Hey, I think this, we're putting out a cold IPA and we're like, Hey, we think cold IPA is, you know, as a style that's going to be worthwhile and let's get out in front of this and do that. And that one's, you know, there's no market date on that. What's the difference between that and IPL? Ours actually, (laughs) we use our, our ale yeast. Okay. Um, yeah, it's all semantics. And I think, I think most of the ones you see the cold IPAs are maybe closer to like the brute IPA yeah. thing a little bit. Mm-hmm. I think most of the IPLs I ever saw where people just took the same malt bill, which 
back then people actually use like crystal malt in their IPAs. No one uses crystal malt anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so then, so they were just, they were just brewing that beer with crystal malt in it and then just switching the, the, the yeast over. Um, but um, yeah, I think, and most of the guys that are making cold IPAs, I think like, like Wayfinder, who's out here, the guy who like originated it, they're, you know, they're using lager yeast on it. Um, but I think they found the sort of balance with what modern IPAs are, like West Coast IPAs, where it's just all like Pilsner malt, there's no crystal malt in it. What will make the uh, cold IPA not a flash in the pan like a brewed IPA? In I your opinion, the, yeah. I, yeah. I, I think it's, I think honestly, it's just the name sounds cool and that's <laughs> a big part of the difference yeah the concept around it is like yeah that's it's you know it's like a it's like a well-packaged bit of marketing like oh this clean crisp drinkable hoppy beer you know whatever it is and you know it, it, it's not any different than functionally probably for the consumer like uh whatever people call them italian pilsners now I mean, just yeah hop pilsners or hoppy pilsners it's totally it achieves the same thing right it's here's an easy drinkable beer that also has a lot of hop flavor which Turns out, hop. Well, mostly, what people care about is like hoppiness in the beer. Um, so, combine you know, session IPA or whatever that was. You know, they just found a sweet spot, and ultimately, cold IPA sounds pretty cool. Yeah. Um, is there a style that you guys just don't brew or don't dabble in? You know, we don't do a lot of um, Belgian styles, really. Um, like, like, like clean ale fermentations. Um, we've we've done our we have our mixed. Um, our mixed fermentation sours, uh, actually a program that I was leading up. So we have a Creek, we had a sour blonde, uh, nice. we had a brune. Um, but yeah, we, you know, and it, it's not like we have any opposition to those styles. It's partially just cause no one's going to buy a six pack of, uh, Belgian triple, a, 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 yeah, Belgian triple <laughs> or, or, or a Belgian single or something yeah, like that. Yeah. I, I, yeah. It's just not something that moves commercially, I think. So definitely. Yeah. So what is your opinion on, I guess, beer style? I never really know how to phrase it per se, but you talk about the cold IPA, you talk about, you know, whatever. I mean, like, is it important to stay true to style? Does it really matter what style you give a beer? I don't, yeah, I don't really think so. I think m maybe in the beer, like a Pilsner mm -hmm. or IPAs, when then, then you kind of have to split the hairs between, Hazy IPA is what it is. And then probably everything else you just kind of call like a West coast IPA yeah. or whatever. We, some people out here will talk like Northwest IPAs. Hmm. Um, but other than that, you can pretty much make things whatever you want it to be. I think, especially something like cold IPA where it's just this like brand new living thing. And you know, there's somebody, you know, Wayfinder is credited with sort of creating it. But like I said, I think there's a lot of semantics to it and it's just, here's a interesting style and, and we can make our iteration of it kind of whatever we want it to be. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's true of a lot of things. Like, I mean, a stout probably needs to be black and have a lot of roasty flavor to it. Right. Um, but the, the, the variety of stouts you can find is, yeah, it's, especially in American craft beer. You know, we just, we <laughs> so many. Whatever the hell we want. <laughs> yeah, there's no rules. Make, make white stouts. And I mean, and hazy IPAs are not IPAs. You know, it's just this weird fruity beer that we've made that has no bitterness to it. It's right. It's just bizarre things so far away from whatever an IPA might have been originally. So yeah, yeah. people make it what they want it to be. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. That's a good way of putting it. Um, so there's multiple rogue locations. We want our listeners to ultimately go to them. So we're going to have a link to your website <laughs> and everything in yeah, our website, in we our doobly do below. <laughs> but um, specifically if we were to send people to go to Newport, um, what would be, you know, your recommendation for like the best restaurant in Newport, uh, best place to see a concert. Oh, okay. And what's the third one? Ryan, Erica, what's the third one? Did you say a restaurant? I did. Hmm. You, you find a third one. Throw something out you want to Yeah, what's out. the third place you'd recommend for people to go outside of Rogue, <laughs> obviously? So, um, the best restaurant in town, depends on what you're looking for. Um, the spot called Local Ocean is like high-end seafood. Um, it's like a, it's like a proper, uh, you know, like a fancy restaurant. It's, it's where you'd go for a, a nicer meal. Um, me and my wife, the first place we try and go is Nana's Irish pub is really good. And they do, they do like some tasty, you know, Irish pubs, some, nice. some baked pies and good fish and chips and stuff like that. Um, yeah. and they'll actually have music there too. And 
honestly, that's probably the only concert I've taken in in Newport. There's also a, a bar called Moby Dicks, which is real divey. Actually, I don't <laughs> know if they survived uh, if they survived COVID. We'll but, have to look uh, it up. It used to be they had like a live cover band and they would play some, they would play some hits. And that was probably, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. That was probably one of the best um, things I ever saw there. But yeah, Newport's interesting. You know, the Oregon coast is in general. It's, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of small towns out there. Newport's one of the bigger towns on the Oregon coast. It has the Oregon coast aquarium. Um, so, and it has um, the, the state, uh, school Oregon State has some like labs out there actually, um, and there's kind of this smaller aquarium that Oregon State has. Um, and then, trying what else is awesome about Newport? There's Moe's. You can go check out. Yeah, Moe's. Check that's out right. Moe's Chowder. Boop, boop. Um, yeah, and then the, it's it's it, if you had to, you know, I lived there for a year. I was happy to move back to Portland because I'm from Portland. And the Oregon coast can be pretty brutal uh, weather-wise. Um, you know, it rains a lot in Portland, but it rains a lot on the Oregon coast. Yeah. Um, and I was out there working like swing shifts and graveyard shifts, and I was just kind of like a zombie existing. <laughs> it was all the same all the time. Two, yeah, just in this <laughs> perpetual winter. Yeah. Um, but the, but but Newport's a beautiful town, and it's. Um, we also have rooms you can stay in above our pub, but like we have like we can rent out like. Uh, we call them the uh, beer and bed, uh, bed and beer. <laughs> nice. Um, and they're, they're actually pretty sweet. We did a big uh, revamp of them at the beginning of That's COVID, awesome. And I would definitely try and check those out as well. Yeah. Noted. What kind of beers can we get at your pub, like outside of, I mean. The flagships. Yeah, people know you for your, you know, Rogue Dead guy and whatever mm -hmm. else. But what are you offering that's different at the pub? So we'll have, um, our R&D beers will be on usually, um, we have a hundred barrel brew house, but we also have a five barrel brew house <clears throat> that we do a lot of our kind of in intermediate uh, test brews going on. So there'll be probably, a, you know, like anything, there's probably a couple IPAs you've never seen anywhere else. Um, probably a couple of lagers we've made. Um, our, I mean, I don't know how much stuff makes it um, out to you guys north of the border, but um, our Rolling Thunder Stout is probably the, one of the coolest things we do. Um, that's a imperial <clears throat> Russian Imperial barrel aged stout, um, aged in barrels that we made. We have a cooperage. We have a cooper who's making barrels. Wow! And then we're putting our whiskey that we distill in that barrel, and then when it gets emptied, we're putting our Russian Imperial Stout in it. And that's like that's cool. That's probably like one of the coolest things that we do. Um, you know, no one else, no one else is doing that, um, all in their own one house. So, right. Right. Um, you'll, you'll find the different iterations of that. You'll find the sours I've been making the fooder age, the Belgian styles. Um, yeah. So I would like to talk about some laws in Oregon that you would like to change related to beer before we wrap this up. All right. So what <laughs> would you like uh, to be changed in the laws or some weird law that you're just like, what the fuck, man? <laughs> Why is this a law? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's weird because um, <clears throat> with COVID, everyone's kind of changing their model of distribution, you know, and it went and very quickly. They kind of just made um, home delivery for beer legal here. Um, so that's, you know, small, small producers could continue to have some sort of lifeblood. And it's weird for a brewery like us because we have those existing distributor um, relationships and, you, you know, you kind of don't want to like screw Step over this toes. distributor. Who is, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so we're in between that. The home delivery stuff is pretty nice, though, for me on a personal scale, especially with COVID. You know, all my buddies that have made the horrible mistake of opening breweries. Um, <laughs> when, when COVID hit, I, you know, it was like a way for them to stay afloat and, you know, trying to buy buy four packs from them and then everybody just bought little vans and was driving around delivering beer all day. If they could, it was definitely feast or famine. Um, there's, there's funny laws about, uh, having to have food. And I think if you have liquor, you have to also serve food. Mm. Um, so there's all these places that make just like horrible, they will literally the like, they have like microwave burritos on their menu just so they can yeah. like serve liquor. And it's yep. kind of a weird thing. Yeah, it's like, I mean, it's like world-class liquor with like 
7-Eleven uh, hot dog. Yeah, exactly. yeah, but also it's kind of like an F you to, you know, the law. Be like, well, you make me have to have food, so here you go. Yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And the thing about Oregon is there's probably no state that's more um, <clears throat> friendly le- legal-wise towards the breweries because um, there's a reason why Oregon is – out here where, you know, we're like pioneers in the, in the craft beer yeah. scene because very early on the like I had mentioned the brew pub stuff, um, they got the laws changed to, so that beers could say, you know, sell out of their location, which is huge. You know, the brew pub model is what keeps small craft breweries alive and lets them flourish. Um, but yeah, in general, you know, they've recognized that craft beer is a big, big economic driver of the state. And we have the Oregon Brewers Festival here and talk about how much money comes into Portland because people are coming from all over to visit. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's sort of a sacred cow and, um, the legislation is pretty friendly to it. Yeah. That's awesome. Were you the innovator behind the Sriracha beer? I, <laughs> were you, <laughs> I got a bone I... to pick with you, mister. No, I'm just it, kidding. Wasn't, it wasn't my idea, Okay. but I did brew the test batch. Okay. That then became the, yeah. Were you? Cool. So like when someone came to you with that idea, were you like, what the hell? Did you have Sriracha at that point before? Or? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I was well aware of it. Um, and the bottle is pretty undeniably iconic. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> I could uh, probably count on one hand the number of times I've drank that beer. Um <laughs> And, uh, but, uh, yeah, that one, that one was not my idea. Okay, cool. And, Thank goodness. Uh, and is Portland <laughs> actually like the show Portlandia or is it? E, um, yeah, sort of. <laughs> so, <laughs> every one of those characters who are like over the top superlative, there's probably one, you could find one person in Portland who is that over the top. Um, I think in general, it's probably would be just like any other city. Uh, but yeah, there do exist these extremes that are uh, you're like, wow, this person's really just walking around life like this. huh? Okay. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, Love we it. we want our listeners to head out to Oregon because there's a great beer scene there. Amazing beer scene. Amazing. Yeah. Ten, some people say it's the best. I mean, I, I don't know. If I, I would, but I've I, never been there I, to heard, say I've that it that. hasn't. It isn't right. the best, but <laughs> Uh, I think Danny can say it's the best, right? I would, I would strongly, yeah, I would put it forth that it is, especially the neighborhood that we're in the, and like the inner Southeast part of Portland is just absurd. There are so many breweries right around here. Excellent. So we want our listeners to travel there, you know, and, uh, enjoy the beer scene, stop in at Rogue at one of their many locations, get a beer and a bed. Yeah, I'm gonna bed and beer. Bed and beer because <laughs> literally that's I should just That's all I want. Oh, I should life. make a t shirt, bed and beer, because Ooh. that's all I feel like. Yeah. I drink one beer and I want to go to bed. So yeah. that's a me problem, not a, a me problem. <laughs> <laughs> but uh Danny, thank you for doing this today. We appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. And uh we're gonna drink some more beer and hang out and you guys just have to imagine what we're talking about. Cool. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.